Hello, my name is Joseph Irishada. I'm the Executive Director and Vice President of the Native Biodata Consortium here in the Cheyenne River Sioux Nation uh, in North Central South Dakota. I'm here to talk to you today about um, Indigenous Peoples Day, formerly known as Columbus Day, and uh, the Doctrine of Discovery. Uh, many of you uh, probably don't know that Columbus actually landed in the Bahamas. He never he never stepped foot on um, the North American or South American mainland. Um, he, uh, despite all of his raiding and treasure hunting and all that kind of thing, um, his actions towards indigenous people actually earned him uh, a certain degree of ignominy uh, with the Spanish. It, he and he died uh, pretty much uh, impoverished, um, not famous like he is today for um, discovering America. Um, the basis for um, any European government, whether it was the French or the Dutch or the Russians or the Spanish or the English, um, was uh, Rome and uh, Rome's um, basically trying to choose which European power to back next and which was going to spread Catholicism and Christianity around the world, um, which by the way, they also did with, with Hitler in Germany. They kind of waited to see who was gonna win that conflict. Um, but basically, um, the Pope granted European countries, at first Portugal and Spain, uh, something called the Intercatera. To own uh, any beach that they landed on. Um, and it got refined later to say any beach that was unoccupied that they landed on. And uh, so it first started with Africa in 1452, then was restated and refined in 1455, uh, and then finally uh, finalized in uh, 1456. Um, that same document, the Intercatera, um, was then uh, extended to the Americas. And there was some, some debate or some legal argument from Portugal um, because the the document was created for Portugal, um, and uh, it's they claim that it violated the original agreement, and that Spain couldn't claim or own um, places in the Americas. But of course, the the Vatican decided that uh, the Intercatera applied to any um, Catholic, European, or Christian nation, and uh, it's been the basis for a lot of bad <laughs> law and policy ever since. Um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg actually used um, a series of um, instantiated documents of law, including the Constitution and going back uh, further and further into European history and struck at the Intercatera uh, of 1492. Um, and, and said that um, the claim or the basis for indigenous sovereignty in the Americas uh, had been nullified by the Intercatera and that sort of there was a statute of limitations by which they can make a complaint. Um, so um, I, I heard that uh, she had not exactly recanted uh, her position, but she felt sorry or regretted her decision, but she never did much to change it. And some people, some Native people who defend Ruth Bader Ginsburg said, well, she did uh, try to make up for it and other kinds of laws uh, since that poor decision that she made. Um, People think that all of the depredations, genocide, land theft, resource theft, uh, economic harm, cultural harm, spiritual harm, and, and physical harm uh, to people in the Americas is over. Um, of course, it's not. Um, 
We know that from the last census, there's about 9.8 million natives in the United States, still a very small part of the U.S. population. In Canada, it's even smaller. In Latin America, um, the official number is 45 million uh, for all of the 638 million people in Latin America. Um, but different NGOs that do reporting to uh, the United Nations and the World Trade Organization and other interested uh, world part, uh, international parties um, have taken their own uh, version of a census and the, the number is closer to 125 million. I found data that actually, if you know, you're know you a little bit liberal with the um, way that people identify in Latin America, you can get it close to uh, 290 million. So that's that's roughly half of the population of Latin America. And then, you know, there's countries all throughout Latin America, like Mexico, um, where they have the concept of mestizaje and uh, the people identify as mestizos. It's a political designation, even though they could be half or more indigenous. They have given up that native identity for a Western civilized identity and if you look at Mexico, currently the statistic says 11% of the population is indigenous, and then um, sorry, 83% or so identify as mestizo with indigenous uh, admixture, and then there's a very small population that have no indigenous roots at all, and lots of uh, Latin America is like that, and so uh, if you look at the 638 million people in Latin America, you have to wonder how many actually carry uh, indigenous um, grandmother or grandfather in their bloodline. So all of this to say that even though the official statistics look grim for, for Native Americans in the uh, Western Hemisphere, um, there is a lot of manipulation of data and identities. Um, take, for instance, Bolivia. Uh, Bolivia is the only indigenous government in uh, the Western Hemisphere, and I'm not discounting uh, tribal nations, of course, um, but they are domestic dependent nations that are reliant and party to uh, treaties with the U.S. federal government, so they're not quite um, as independent as Bolivia is. Bolivia um, ha has been the only indigenous government in Western Hemisphere for quite a long time. And um, as many of you know, uh, they had uh, discovered lithium. Lithium is something that's very much um, desired by the world tech community. And an attempted coup happened um, a few years ago. And they were by mestizos, mestizos who had given up their native identity. And there was a lot of violence. And there was lots of calls uh and finger pointing from both sides that the other side was fascist um the united states said that uh, evo morales and the indigenous government was somehow undemocratic point their finger back at the united states and this isn't something new i mean the united states and uh kissinger have done um manipulations in central america during the reagan wars um the trumped up sorry pardon the pun trumped up drug wars in latin america and then, of course, way back when with uh, Allende and the Pinochet coup. Um, so these things keep happening. Um, they don't get talked about very often in the uh, public media. Um, but if you're an academic or a historian buff, or you're unfortunate enough to be a citizen of one of these countries where it's happening, and you can see it, but nobody's coming to your aid like they're coming to the aid of the Ukraine right now, um, you know that it's happening. Uh, so what I'm trying to get at is what the Native Biodata Consortium is trying to do is trying to not only talk about these issues, but talk about the different um, ways that wars are fought now instead of wars of, um, you know, violence and military hardware and uh, tons of um very visible dead bodies. There's other ways. Um, there's things like high fructose corn syrup, 
uh, that has not only affected Native people, but affected all poor people all around the world uh, since the 1980s. If you see the rise of the production of high fructose corn syrup, its addition into many different foods that it shouldn't be in, like pasta, uh, and the cost reduction of that food for uh, quote unquote lower classes, you see a commensurate rise in diabetes and obesity and other metabolic diseases. And it's an economic and a food war. Um, and as I said, with um, some of these new minerals, rare earth minerals like lithium, um, you're seeing this also being waged. Um, and of course, the, the the misinformation campaigns you hear on all kinds of social media and, and mainstream media about um, prioritizing one conflict like Ukraine and Russia and not talking at all about what Bolsonaro was doing when he was the president of Brazil to the Amazon. Um, so what we do is uh, we try to delay some of it by creating a safe harbor um, for data and samples, because right now data and samples are currency. Um, it doesn't matter what kind of data, it could be um, criminal forensic data, it could be ancient anthropology like uh, the ancient one, Kenny Wickman or the Anzic family in Montana. Um, it could be uh, the microbiome in a polluted or a non-polluted river. Um, it could be, um, telltale signs of changes in um, the atmosphere or the microbial life or the plant life that would lead you uh, like breadcrumbs to mineral resources like oil um, or precious metals. Um, and <clears throat> the technologies we have now um, are disruptive technologies. Disruptive technologies are by definition um, things that change the status quo tremendously. And they have about four components. One is that they um, combine technologies, right? So your cell phone combined TV, it combined a calendar, it combined, uh, you know, voice memos and uh, messaging systems like your, uh, back in the day when we had, um, uh, answering machines. It's a telephone, it's a camera, it does a whole bunch of things. Uh, the second thing um, from, that disruptive technologies do is that they make lots of other technologies um, obsolete, like permanently. Uh, so if you think about um, DVDs and what they did to videotape, right? Uh, nobody's ever going to go back to videotape. Uh, and then they they often go unregulated for quite a long time because the world can't adapt fast enough to the benefits of disruptive technology. It's just happening uh, very quickly. And you have a Wild West scenario where companies and individuals are scrambling to get to the top of this new uh, technological mountain and often... Um, governments can't keep up. And then the last thing is that they quickly fade into the background that you don't even notice um, that they're there anymore. So again, with your cell phone, um, you have Siri and all of these other um, sort of machine learning apps that uh, hear your voice and find things for you or turn on your lights or turn off your lights and do all kinds of other things. They just, they become so everyday and convenient. Um, you don't remember what life was like before. Like I said, you don't remember when you didn't have an answering machine. You don't remember when you couldn't watch a movie whenever you wanted to. It's a whole bunch of things just become normalized. And with that normalization, also um, the ownership and the regulation also becomes very far in the background. You don't know who or what is doing these things and how that they're controlled or how if you want to give them up, you can give them up. And we were at this point, you know, at the turn of the century in the 1900s, um, right before the world uh, stock market crash, 
in the Great Depression. And back then it was steam engines and cars driven by gasoline and a whole host of other industrial operations um, that was causing this big fight between corporations and the government. And the government kept trying to uh, put anti-monopoly laws in place and um, you know, trying to create laws around trusts um, and a whole a whole host of other things where the government and, and private corporations were at odds. And, and it resulted in, it's arguably that it resulted in not only the Great Depression, but World War I and World War II. Um, so that's kind of where we are right now. You know, the ability to extract resources the ability to commercialize nature is highly dependent on technology and how fast you can deploy that technology and how fast you can deploy that technology without competitors or without laws. And uh, right now we find ourselves in that same space, the big data space, big data uh, was made possible by uh, this device I'm talking to you on, the computer. Um, we can <laughs> imagine how, uh, Imagine how big computers used to be, and they can only do a few things. Um, now they can calculate large numbers. They can produce video. They can record audio. Um, they can store vast amounts of information and send it across the world through the internet uh, to some other legal jurisdiction. That could never happen before. So big data has been uh, driven by the uh, information technology sector in Silicon Valley. And now that's being paired with other disruptive technologies, extractive technologies known as omics. So that is the study and the collection of DNA, RNA, proteins, metabolites, uh, mitochondria, uh, the microbiome, um, and, and a whole host of other um, sort of biological processes. And this is being applied to humans and plants, animals, um, and things you can't see like viruses and um, subsurface animals like worms or sub-ocean um, things like worms uh, that are just worth tons and tons of money. So data is money. Uh, biological samples are money, uh, minerals are worth money, and, you know, as our technology becomes bigger, better, faster, stronger, we can see this web of life and this web of non-life, inorganic and organic things on the earth are connected to each other, and we see it no more better than in climate change, right? You pull on this thread and something happens over here, uh, where before it would take us, you know, years and drastic differences in temperature to notice that something we did caused an effect. It's not like that anymore. We can see with the technology how these different um, systems are connected and systems biology the study of systems, whether it's an internet system or a political system, those are all things that now machine learning and artificial intelligence are being applied to. It's like, all right, like we can't see how this election was won or lost. Let's put computers on it because we just have these five senses, but a computer is not restricted to that. Um, and uh, it's it's scary for everybody. It's certainly scary for uh, those people in the middle and lower classes, of course, um, to think that people uh, with more resources can surveil us and control us and manipulate us. But believe it or not, it's also scary to the billionaires because they are not sure uh, how many people. I mean, you guys all know your children, right? They're they're little hackers. They can they can find anything and anybody on the web. And of course, there's people with greater skills than your teenage daughter or son. And um, machine learning gives them a lot of capabilities. So even the people at the top are like, wait, we want the lens only shining this direction. We don't want it shiny back on us. And right now, they're not so certain that's possible. 
So you've had, uh, you know, some letters this past year that called for a pause in machine learning and AI, uh, but from both the people on the left and from the people on the right, because they're not really sure what it's going to do. And of course, um, the uh, one of the better known scientists at Google quit because he wasn't liking the directions Google that Google was taking uh, artificial intelligence, and he's one of the world's experts. Um, uh, and we're getting, you know, we're getting different um, types of news from, you know, our government, from politicians, from corporations, on whether or not we should be worried about climate change or environmental contamination, um, uh, the propagation of viruses because we're moving into and out of territories we'd never been to before, the the melting ice at both poles and things that have been frozen in the ground for you know 40 50 thousand years and they're now out and about and living among us um, dragging things up from the bottom of the ocean all kinds of things and uh, it's technology it's technology that does that and it's a lack of regulation so our little company here um, in a very rural and very uh, sparsely inhabited space in South Dakota is trying uh, to get the message out there and trying to do what we can to sort of give the power back to the people. People on all of that data and all of that, um, all of those samples here, we don't make a distinction between samples and data. It, it has been like that for a long time since. Uh, something called the Belmont Report was put in place in the 70s, um, that samples belong to the individual and data belong to the general public. Um, it's really not like that anymore because um, the cost of collecting samples or the uniqueness of samples almost guarantees they're going to be digitized at some point. What we've noticed is that <clears throat> by calling them two different things, it puts people at odds with their people group um, or their government. Mm -hmm. And it allows sort of this individual gig economy to happen where people can buy little bits of data here and there and compile their own little treasure chest of data uh, without the people who they're getting it from not knowing how it's going to be used or how it's going to be used against them. I'm going to say 2017 or so, most governments and and law enforcement didn't really favor DNA, but now they want to collect a lot of DNA. They want to collect DNA at both borders because of terrorist threat. They want to collect DNA because of immigrant threats. They want to collect DNA for the military to protect the soldiers. They want to collect DNA uh, to do more surveillance on people. And they have the ability to put more people in jail. So. Uh, you have to watch carefully of what's going on and how information is used and how it's used against people groups. And lots of us don't know how it's going to be used. It could be used to deny us health services, to deny us life insurance. We don't know because we're not the ones with the money. We're not the ones making the policies. Um, so, yeah, it, it ends up uh, being a promise of this new age of medicine and science and finding lost children and finding lost women and solving rape cases that's the promise but then those promises never come to fruition in fact the opposite happens and things get worse for people uh, of color and people who are from populations that are considered not desirable by mainstream society So again, just to reiterate all of those things that may happen and cause a dystopia from this current crossroads we're at of disruptive technologies, lack of regulation, lack of public understanding of what these technologies are doing and these extreme right movements that are going on worldwide in the face of climate change, um, we are at risk, and the NBDC is here to help and stop uh, some of that risk. So with that, I wish you a happy Indigenous Peoples Day, and then I hope you are safe and sound and that you've learned something from this video.